yeah, the post-exercise anabolic window. What we're talking about today is, is it actually real? Now there's a lot of confusion in this field and I'm gonna set you straight in just a couple of minutes. And in fact, I think I can do this in under 25, but we'll see how derailed I actually get. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, the post-exercise anabolic window is this concept that it's really important uh, that within 30 or 60 or 90 minutes, some number that people seem to disagree on, that you need to get your nutrients in post-workout. If not, you, you'll minimize your gains, or in other words, you won't maximize your gains. So this is based on the concept that your muscle cells are more sensitive to nutrients immediately post-exercise, so if you wait to consume your food too long, you won't get the maximum amount of gains or recovery. So let's actually answer it and go directly into it. I'm not going to mess around this time. In this episode of the 25-Minute Fizz, post-exercise anabolic window. So is it real? Despite what you may have heard on the internet or on probably Twitter or Instagram, it's 100% real. Make no, no questions or mistakes about it, everyone. Your muscle cells are absolutely more sensitive to nutrients post-exercise, assuming you did some reasonably hard exercise. Now, if you just went for a walk, it probably doesn't matter. I'm talking about something that was hard, or reasonably hard. So yeah, again, let me clarify, it is 100% real. Your cells are definitely more sensitized to nutrients, particularly carbohydrates and protein, immediately post-exercise, or even during exercise for that matter. I think where the confusion actually happens is, is, is the next piece, though. Does it actually matter to you? Now that's a big difference. So it's not, we're not questioning whether or not it's a real physiological phenomenon, we're questioning, does it actually matter for you? And in order for me to answer that, I have to know the context of the question. And this is what actually uh, people get so confused about is we wanna make blanket statements like, yes, it's real, no, it's not real, and we don't wanna have the nuanced discussion about the context, and that's where the truth lies. And this is why several people that you may have heard may sound like they're contradicting each other, but they're really talking about what is quote unquote true in different situations. So let's get into that, and I'll show you some examples, and I promise you by the end of this video, you will not be clear, confused at all about what's going on here. You'll know exactly what to do, when you shouldn't matter about the window, and when you shouldn't care at all. So let's dive into it. Uh, what I mean by context is this. Let's take a couple of different examples. First and foremost, whether or not you should care about the post-exercise anabolic window or the recovery window, whatever you want to call it, depends on your training goal. Which, or you're trying to maximize muscle hypertrophy, we're trying to get stronger, we're trying to improve sport performance, we're trying to improve uh, marathon running. What are we actually training for? That determines a lot of it. How about daily routine? Are you training fasted? Some people like to wake up in the morning and consume you know, two or 300 calories or less and then work out. They feel better on an empty stomach. Well, that's way different than an athlete who's training at 7 p.m. after three meals and 3,000 calories. So that's gonna determine how important it is to have nutrients post-exercise or not. What nutrients are we talking about? The answer is different if we're talking about protein compared to carbohydrates. What about personal preferences? Again, some people don't like to eat immediately post-exercise. Some people prefer that. Uh, some people's stomachs are more sensitive and they need a half an hour, an hour before they get something in. Same thing in the morning. Let's not force feed our athletes breakfast if they're not a breakfast person, if it makes them nauseous, etc. All right. And what about logistics? So if you're like an NCAA athlete and you're having to leave your strength conditioning session and go immediately to an hour and a half of film or to class or things like that, that's different than somebody who's working out in the evening and then they're sitting at home. So what's going on logistically? Do I have to travel? Do I have to go to my next practice? Do I have media? What else is happening um, on that end? And then anything else, right? The context, these are just five or so, six examples. But you've got to think through what you're actually dealing with to understand what other situations should you, should you factor in the equation. I'm not going to give you them all. I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of thinking. So I want to walk you through one specific example, or two rather, so you can have some tangible things to think about. So what I've done is I've, I'm going to make you a little bit of a score sheet. Okay? And we're talking about the post-exercise nutrient window. So in other words, is it important? in two different training scenarios where you get your carbohydrates in really close to or immediately post-exercise. And then the same thing for protein. And the two training scenarios I've come up with are two friends of mine. So on top, um, you'll see Zoila Franco there, and Zoila is a professional fighter, fights in Muay Thai and kickboxing and, and most recently MMA. She's a world champion. 
All right, so she's a, an athlete. Uh, she's typically gonna train 14 to, if it's up to her, more like 18 times a week. This means she's training typically a minimum of twice per day uh, and oftentimes three times per day. And when I say training, I really mean exercise. I don't mean watching film or walkthroughs. That, that, that's pretty physical um, in all of those things. So keep that in mind. Again, two to three training sessions a day, six times a week uh, or more. And we'll compare that to my friend Chris and we'll assume, obviously from the picture there, uh, Chris's training goal is hypertrophy. Now this is significantly different because number one, the outcome is obviously different. But think about the training. So someone who's trying to maximize hypertrophy might be lifting every day, but they're very rarely lifting the same muscle group on multiple days. So in this example, if Chris did his legs on Monday, he's probably not going to do legs again on Tuesday. At best, it'd be Wednesday, probably most realistically Thursday. So really, even if he's training seven days a week, most of the time in hypertrophy scenarios, uh, at most you're gonna train any individual muscle group three times a week, more like twice with about 72 hours different. Zoila's legs get crushed every single workout, right? She has to have her quads back two to three times a day because they're involved in basically everything she does, right? Neither one of these is better and worse, but they're different scenarios. So let's start with the top. What about Zoila for carbohydrates? Is it important that she gets her carbs in as close to or immediately post exercise as possible? Well, if you look across the literature and the science that's gonna support this, as well as my practical experience and findings, it's incredibly important, right? We do not wanna waste any time with getting those carbohydrates in. If it's me, I actually prefer they drink them during the workout, but immediately post or pre is, is even better. We have to resynthesize muscle glycogen. So the vast majority of the energy she's, go she's going to get for her workouts come from the, the stored glycogen uh, or the carbohydrates in her muscle. The most direct, direct way to replenish that carbohydrate is to consume carbohydrate. And again, we have less than four hours typically, or maybe five to six to restore that. And we're gonna be doing that multiple times in a row, four, five, six days in a row, for eight to 10 to 12 weeks. We don't have any time to mess around. We need to get that carbohydrate in really, really fast. So we're in that case, we're gonna choose low fiber, uh, high glycemic index foods to get that stuff in immediately or as quickly as you possibly can. In terms of protein for Zoila, I would actually say it's the same thing. Now, we'll get into total protein intake throughout the day a little bit in a second, but this is a logistic concern, right? So we, have, we know that consuming protein post-exercise doesn't harm muscle glycogen resynthesis. So it doesn't necessarily aid it a whole lot, um, but it may provide a slight bump to slightly nothing. It's gonna start aiding in muscle recovery, maybe not a whole lot, but some. But more importantly here, we just have logistics to consider. If we don't get that stuff in immediately post-exercise, what else are we going to eat? She's gonna be training again in a few hours. She's got travel, she's got things to set up, she's coaching, she's got other things to do. If we wait to eat, we're screwed. And so it's really important that we get that stuff in even for protein. So the carbohydrates is a real science, a physiology concern. The protein though, I would say, is, is more of a logistics practical scenario. Why, why would I recommend that for her? Now as we transition and look at Chris and his muscle hypertrophy, are carbohydrates needed immediately post-exercise for that? Probably not. All right. um, if you're gonna be training the muscle group again the next day, you might wanna get your carbohydrates in. But again, as I already explained, typically for hypertrophy, you got at least 48 hours, maybe more like 72 hours. Within that time domain, you're very likely to be able to restore your carbohydrates as long as you're consuming enough of those over the next couple of days. Now, another misconception that we had 10 years ago or so, but now it's sort of gone, is the protein here. And the evidence is generally fairly clear here, which, and it would support the fact that your total protein intake throughout the day, and probably honestly even more like over the course of 36 or 48 hours, matters more than the exact timing. So even for hypertrophy and protein, it doesn't necessarily matter if you have it pre, mid, post, or even wait a few hours, just get it in throughout the day. Now, interestingly, we are actually right now in the middle of a study in which we're looking at uh, intermittent fasting, so the people that wait to consume their protein only, or all their food rather, within an eight hour window versus those who consume it all throughout the day. And the goal here where our study is different is the goal is actual maximizing hypertrophy. And so we're gonna see in young, well-trained people uh, whether or not that, that timing really does matter when we give them a really specific eating scenario. Okay, but for the most part right now, the literature suggests timing is really fairly irrelevant 
And it's really just a matter of the 24 to almost 48 hour window that you get enough in there. Now, some people have misinterpreted this though, to mean that you should wait. And that's not at all what I just said. All I said was it doesn't matter. And so my actually counter to this is, yeah, but it doesn't hurt to get it in immediately. Right? And it's not helping anything to wait. There's no added benefit to waiting. It doesn't hurt to have it immediately in. Does it help? No, but it doesn't hurt either. So I don't understand the logic of waiting outside of having a, like a practical scenario, like an athlete or a client doesn't like eating. They have a heart, their stomach is upset and they want an hour to settle. Okay, fine. But I haven't seen any evidence to suggest it's something you should go out of your way to do to wait on purpose. All that means is you're going to have to have more protein and higher concentration later on. And we know that's generally not a good thing. Protein, especially for muscle hypertrophy, is better consumed more frequently in smaller amounts than big boluses at the end of a day or in a couple of meals. And so while it doesn't particularly matter when you consume, for the most part, um, your protein for hypertrophy, I don't see any rationale to wait outside of you know, personal preference, right? So I still, still typically say, well, you might as well try to get in as soon as you can, right? No harm here. So now that you've understood that, I'll give you, I'll go back to this context slide and I'll give you a few more of these examples. So we've gone through the hypertrophy thing, right? Uh, that's hopefully that's pretty clear. What about someone who's trying to maximize muscle strength? Right? Well, hopefully, and I'm not going to give the answer, you've got to think on your own, you could go through protein and carbohydrates and think, well, is it important for that person or not? Uh, I've also got on this list now things like repeated sprint ability. So this would be an athlete like Zoila who's got to do repeated high intensity stuff. In that particular case, it's probably pretty important to have the carbohydrates in immediately. Whether you want to wait on protein, that may or may not matter. Uh, an athlete in the middle of the season, you have a lot of muscle damage, a lot of banging going on, like a contact or combat sport athlete. I probably wouldn't wait to get their protein in. Uh, we want to maximize that tissue recovery as fast as we can, but again, we're not talking hypertrophy here. In terms of daily routine, if I have an individual who fasts or like to work out again early in the morning, either fasted, which I typically don't advise, um, or really low calorie, in that situation, since they've now gone 12, 14, 16 hours, about nutrients, I think it's probably pretty important for those folks to get both their carbs and protein in pretty much immediately. If you're training at seven o'clock in the afternoon after three or four meals, it probably doesn't matter at all for your protein and even maybe your carbohydrate really doesn't matter. Right? You're gonna have now 24 hours to recover, you're gonna be probably just fine. We've gone through the nutrients and again, typically the summary here would be carbohydrates, the timing matters a lot more, protein, even regardless of goal, probably doesn't matter a ton. Yeah. Personal preference, I've given you some examples of that. You could think of more. Um, some people like to eat pre-workout, some people don't, and post-workouts, etc. Logistics, I know that, for example, in college athletes, it's hard to trust them. Uh, they've got a lot of things going on, and so a lot of coaches will say, hey, you're not leaving the, room, the weight room here until you get that chocolate milk down. And that's not necessarily because they're super concerned with the post-exercise anabolic window, but it's more because they're just concerned they're gonna, the athlete's gonna leave and they're gonna either make bad nutrition choices or they become distracted and um, not drink for two or three, four hours consuming nutrients, etc. right? And so instead of having a carbohydrate, high carbohydrate, high quality protein meal, they might go get fast food or something else that's a lot higher in fat, which is not great post-exercise. All right, so, uh, some more examples there, and I would encourage you to think on your own about your own situation and determine how important or not the post-exercise anabolic window is for your outcome goal, your training goal, as well as the nutrients themselves. What I'm really highlighting here, hopefully, is getting to this concept that I like to say is, is perspective influences the truthiness. Now, I know truth is, is not a word, but it kind of is. Thank you, Stephen Colbert. My point here being, when you're trying to determine things like, is the post-exercise anabolic window quote unquote real? Well, what, what is true or the, you know, the, the right answer, it depends on a lot on your perspective. And hopefully we've addressed that and you're understanding this concept. It extends to just about everything else, right? So we have very few black and white answers and a lot more things that depend on context and nuance. The problem is, 
almost all of us, myself included, have a certain set of lenses in which they're seeing the world. And you can see Kara in the picture here, she's zooming in, looking very intently through a certain set of lenses, right? Which, which is another way of saying we all have a given perspective. You might be following somebody who's a scientist or an expert in muscle hypertrophy. And you can then pretty much assume they're always thinking about uh, training adaptations, nutrition, programming from the context of hypertrophy. And so what would be true or a thing that you would always want to do or never want to do when the goal is hypertrophy may or may not be the same thing for a performance athlete. That may or may not be the same thing for general health or fat loss. Again, we all have perspectives. We shouldn't be worried about that. We just need to acknowledge that. So I'm totally cool with you zooming in and, and, and keeping your eyes down on, the, on those two microscopes at all times. But just realize a, that there is a microscope there and that you're zoomed in and you have tunnel vision and you're probably not at all times considering enough different perspectives. All right? So make sure you figure out what that lens is for you and adjust accordingly when needed. Right? So if you are typically working with fat loss clients and now you have an athlete or client that comes to you and wants to improve their basketball performance, you really need to take the time to rethink all the things that you do, the recommendations and the prescriptions you have regarding their context, not yours. So to give you some tangible examples of that, uh, I like to think of it this way. When you're trying to look at the data or the science and you're trying to come up with the right answer. Well, the data are what the data are, and there's really no arguing with that. Unless you're a scientist and we can argue over your study design, your methodology, your stats. If you're a general practitioner, that's not really your job. But your job is the next two pieces, and that's interpretation and context. And those two things are a matter of perspective. Right? Now, the authors of studies will typically give you their interpretation because they have a certain set of perspectives. But again, please don't let that influence yours. So if you see a study that shows, hey, carbohydrate post-exercise was better than carbs and protein or wasn't better than carbs and protein post-exercise, okay, great, those are what the data are. But the interpretation, in other words, therefore, what's that mean, is up to you because only, only you know your perspective. So you could then take that and say, okay, great, for a fat loss client, maybe carbs don't matter then. But hey, for a repeated exercise individual who's training twice a day for their mountain bike race, well, maybe that's a different answer, etc. Right? So please, please, please consider how to interpret the data. Don't worry about arguing with the validity of the data too much. If you're not a scientist. But the interpretation and the context is up to you and it is completely changed by perspective. So the analogy I'll give you here is this. This is, of course, a recent incident where a Tesla was on autopilot and actually drove into the side of a building. So even though we have some of the best scientists in the world and hundreds of millions of dollars and engineers up the Yahoo uh, making these auto driving cars and the science is unbelievable and they're so incredibly accurate 99% of the time, you still can't take your hands and eyes fully off the wheel. So I would say the same thing for you. Even though you can follow some scientists online and you can go to conferences and clinics and there's some really smart scientists out there, don't take your hands entirely off the wheel. You still have to think, right? Don't let them drive your car on autopilot for you. You can let them get you most of the way there, but keep your eyes on the wheel still or your eyes on the road and your hands at least hovering over that wheel because they may not be able to always see exactly what's happening in your world. So that's why I say nutrition science is a bit like autopilot mode on a Tesla. Pretty damn good. And there's some real sharp scientists out there, but always keep your head in the game. So the lesson I hope you learned from today's video is what I call amateur scientists and armchair coaches. So the amateur scientists are the coaches and practitioners who you know, look at some science and think they know the answer to everything. Right? So it's like, well, great, science showed you should always, or the post-exercise anabolic window is complete garbage. No, that's not what the science says. Like, try not to overinterpret science like that if you're not a scientist. On the flip side, the armchair coaches so these are scientists who do one study and therefore think they know how to tell all coaches what to, what to do. Well, probably not, because you're probably only considering one training outcome and not all the rest, not logistics, not what it's like to actually work with a human being and, and all things, all those other considerations, right? 
And then finally, that nutrient timing um, is more than just protein and hypertrophy. The vast majority of the conversation in the nutrient timing world is sort of fixated on that, and I don't want, and that's important, but I don't want you to be disillusioned into thinking that's the only consideration, and therefore protein timing or uh, nutrient timing doesn't matter. So to summarize, uh, what we currently know in the literature suggests regarding post-exercise nutrients. Number one, it may not, you may not need it exactly post-exercise or anything like that, but it doesn't hurt either, right? So there's no advantage to waiting. Number two there, if you're training fasted, maybe you want to consume those essential amino acids or complete proteins and carbohydrates as soon as you possibly can with very little fat. However, if you're training fed, the total amount of, of essential amino acids and protein especially consumed throughout the day or a, over a two-day period is probably more important than the timing itself. However, if the single goal is to maximize recovery, why not just maximize the volume of carbs or protein all day? Right? If, you're just, if you're in the middle of the season or really trying to focus on recovery, why skimp? Just get it all there as much as possible. Try to top off everything. If the goal is to lose weight, though, or fat loss more specifically, I would still concentrate those, those proteins, amino, essential amino acids, and carbohydrates around your training, and then cut your calories on off days or on meals that are away from your training. All right? That'll help you maximize your recovery, maximize your muscle growth or maintenance and repair, uh, and you can still be in a hypochloric state if that's the goal. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about uh, this exercise concept, nutrition concept, but also you, hopefully you've learned a little bit more about the idea of being a knower versus a learner. So your homework today from this video is to Google those terms and search that. I think we need a lot more people to understand this concept and spend a lot more time in one of these than the other. Hint, hint. Right. So Google that around, I'm not going to walk you through it, but it's a really, really, really important thing for both scientists, I, I think scientists do an incredibly poor job of this, they get really stuck into one of the categories here, uh, and then practitioners tend to be a little bit better, uh, but the, science, the scientist community could really improve here. Uh, the Instagram models, the influencers are just epically terrible at this. In fact, their whole job is to be completely on one side of the equation and to convince you so hard to buy their stuff by acting like they're they're really far down one end of the spectrums, right? So I would typically say, this is another way for me to advertise it, uh, better decision making on your part for your clients, yourself, your athletes, individuals, is what I'll call being wise. And everybody, we want to be wise. We don't want to be smart. We don't want to know things. We don't want to know information. We want to make better decisions, right? And in order to do that, we have to have good quality information, good data. We've got to pay attention to the science. We've got to go to clinics and conferences and know what's going on. But we gotta combine that with our understanding of context and have some humility. We don't know everything, we don't know every situation, and just because someone's making a different decision than we think is good, we may not know everything that's going on, right? And with the acknowledgement that the reason we continue to study things like this is we don't know everything. There are still pieces to this information or pieces to this scenario, but we don't know yet. So as more research comes out, I may change my position on some or all of this stuff, right? So there's always a little bit of humility we have to have, uh, especially in the fields of nutrition and, and high performance. If you want to read more about this topic, I would strongly encourage you to read the ISSN, International Society of Sports Nutrition's a position stand on nutrient timing. Chad Kirksick led this thing up, and it's fantastic. They cover a lot of this stuff. They go deep into the science if you want to know that, but they also give you really good summaries and take-homes with numbers, how many carbs, how many protein, what's the scenario, different situations, and all that. It's fantastic. It's free. It's open access. So good on you, ISSN and, and Dr. Kirksick, for, for leading this up. That being said, I appreciate the time, and we'll see you around next time. Be, feel, please feel free to check out more of these 5, 25, and 55-minute videos. I got all kinds of ones on nutrition, strength training, programming, general health and human performance. Um, if you're digging these things, you know what to do. Help me out. All right, see you later.